السلام عليك يا أمين الله السلام عليك يا أمير المؤمنين. When we analyze and study the Holy Quran, we recognize that there is a concept which is known as the days that belong to Allah, God the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in Surah Ibrahim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ It's a command to the prophets to remind people about specific days that belong to Allah. Of course, every day belongs to Allah, like every human being is a servant of God. But there are individuals who recognize this and work towards actually uh, earning that particular description to be known as Abdullah. Similarly, there are special days of the year in which the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed and has made so significant because something happened on that day which brings people closer to God, which somehow establishes the whole objective of creation. And indeed, we are told that these days are days uh, that are to do with the strengthening of faith, that are to do with the reminder that people should have about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no doubt, of course, that uh, amongst the greatest days uh, that the uh, uh, history of uh, the mankind has seen is the day of Ghadir, the 18th of the holy month of the Al-Hajjah, 10 years after the migration of the Holy Prophet. In today's society, uh, in the modern world, Ghadir is referred to as uh, an event that took place after the Prophet's final Hajj, where he came to an area known as Ghadir al Khum, which is near Juhafa. Uh, this is about approximately 70 days before the Prophet's death. And um, it was a place where he gathered. Uh, all the Muslims that were with him, which were numerous, uh, we're looking at 100,000, 100,000 people. Uh, some narrations say 120,000, some up to 125,000 people. Um, but at least, at least 100,000 people were there. Uh, and that in itself is a significant uh, number because there's no uh, event, no hadith, and no uh, gathering that's larger than that in the time of the Holy Prophet Islam. Ten years after the migration of the Prophet, peace be upon him and his pure family, from Mecca to Medina, the Holy Prophet, after those years, and conveying the message of Allah, the exalted, he went for his final Hajj, which is known as the Farewell Hajj, Hajjatul Wida. And he had two main objectives for this pilgrimage. Number one was to teach people, the Muslims in that time, the Hajj rituals as an obligatory act within the Sharia. Ah. And number two, to appoint the commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace be upon him, as his vicegerent and his successor and Khalifa after his departure. So those two main objectives were achieved by the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him and his pure family. So it, it is described as the day and this day is significant, significant Quranically because it highlights it is not only a 24 hour, so, so to speak, time span, but rather it is uh, an indication of a period of time which is very, very delicate, significant, sacred and important. Similar to how the Almighty says, I've created the heavens and the earth in six days. Um, it is not the days that people are used to, 
but rather periods of time. And therefore, Quranically, the concept of day is significant, similar to the Quran saying the day of Qiyamah, the day of judgment, uh, referring to a time of real importance. Similarly, the same can be said about the day of Ghadir. On the journey to Hajj, know that because there's so many things to do in a very short period of time, uh, everyone is worried about regarding the Hajj and making sure that it's correct and everything that they do ends up being correct and accepted and they don't do anything that will necessitate them giving kafara for example or invalidating the act or so on and so forth. So for example, uh, if we look at the Hajj, it's, it's divided into two distinct parts. There's the first part of the Hajj, which is the Umrah Tamattu, when you reach uh, you go towards uh, the Kaaba, you go towards Masjid Haram, you do the Tawaf, do the Sa'i from Safa to Marwa and back. And then you do the Salat of the Tawaf and the uh, after f completing the Sa'i, you do your Taqseer and that completes your Umrah Tamattu, which is the first part of the Hajj. Then you start the second part of the Hajj, which is going towards Arafah, uh, on the day of Arafah, usually on the night of Arafah, but the Wujub is from the day of Arafah. So on the day of Arafah, and then from Arafah to go towards Mash'ar, which is also called Muzdalifah, and then from there to go to Mina in order to stone the Shaitan and to of a Qurbani and then shave your head at Mina and then complete, you've completed your Hajj to then go back towards Mecca, towards Masjid al-Haram and do your Tawaf and your Sa'i and your Tawaf and Nisa to complete the Hajj. Now the Holy Prophet Islam takes people on this journey of Hajj uh, after having completed their first part of the Umrah Tamattu now when they're going towards the Hajj Tamattu uh, to go towards Arafah, to go towards Mina, towards, towards Muzdalifa. All of these places are very important places. Uh, the Holy Prophet of Islam uh, stops in these places and he delivers sermons. He tells us, he tells the people about the importance of these particular uh, places. So there's a sermon of the Holy Prophet at Arafah, there's a sermon at Mash'ar, there's a sermon at Mina. And all of these sermons are, are uh, hinting towards this same message that's going to come at the end of the Hajj as well. That uh, this is uh, my final journey, I'm about to leave you, what's going to happen after I leave, what's going to, what's your responsibility and what do you need to do after I go. All of these things are being uh, subtly being delivered by the Holy Prophet Islam during this time where he's um, going through the Hajj rituals. And of course, uh, to do, to perform, to uh, act the Hajj rituals with the Holy Prophet of Islam is a special kind of blessing in that uh, there is a 100% guarantee that every single ritual that I'm doing, whatever I'm doing, is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to do it. That I'm watching the Holy Prophet of Islam and I'm imitating the Holy Prophet of Islam in doing so. So the Holy Prophet Islam is now travelling back to, having completed the Hajj, travelling back to Medina from Mecca. But the reason he goes towards this area, this place, is because there's crossroads of people leaving towards their various different destinations, towards the south of Arabia and Yemen, towards the east and Najd and towards the west, all of the uh, pathways are separating from this particular place. The area or the actual place, um, we know that it was a station where people who were traveling uh, would come to this point and there were pathways going towards the north, the south, the east, the west, so everyone would kind of collect there and it was, a, it was an area of saying farewell and saying your goodbye, so if people came from far, uh, you would accompany them to Ghadir Khum. And from there you would say your farewells and your goodbyes and you'd let them go ahead. So it was like a, a, a meeting, greeting and a farewell station. Similar to an airport, because obviously people from airports travel here and there and you'll see people are arriving, so you welcome them. And also people are departing, so you'd say goodbye at the airport, your final goodbyes. So Khadir Khum was something like that. 
So the Holy Prophet Islam is now completed the Hajj. Now he's going towards Medina and he stops at this place, uh, which is known as uh, Ghadir Khum. Uh, or Khum, Ghadir means a pond in Arabic. Uh, and because there's a pond there and this is Khum. Um, again, some of the people who've been for Hajj will know that uh, one of the places where you can initiate your Ihram, the Miqat, is called Juhfa, which is where uh, it would, which is the place where the uh, event of Ghadir took place. And therefore, many of the Mu'mineen like to uh, use that miqat of Juhfa in order to put on the ihram to go for Hajj. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and spirit family, ordered Bilal to announce that all Muslims should gather in a place called Ghadir Khum, a place in the middle of the desert with the, with a pond of water, few palm trees, to gather there for an important event. So those who were going back to their uh, locations had to come back again to this place, and those who were still in Mecca to actually join those who are in, in, in Ghadir Khum and wait for the Prophet's arrival to announce an important announcement. And of course, when the Holy Prophet reached in, in Ghadir Khum, he ordered that uh, Muslims would uh, collect the saddles of, of the camels and to form something like a, a pulpit, a member, so they can go up over that member and appoint Ali alayhi salam before the eyes of thousands and thousands of Muslims and Sahaba. So everyone would have a look and view this event. So nobody would say, oh, I, I didn't see the Prophet uh, you know, raising the hand of Ali alayhi salam. He was just you know, giving a sermon. I didn't see anybody with him. So everything was there to be seen and recorded for the cause of history, for the cause of the humanity after thousands of years to know that this bay'ah and this allegiance took place and all the Sahaba, even the women, witnessed and saw that the Holy Prophet raised the hand of Ali alayhi salam and appointed him as his wise gerent and Khalifa after him. So in terms of the actual landscape of Ghadir, uh, you know, there's an oasis, there's a pond, there's palm trees up, but there's also two raised wells. Now these two wells were dug up by Abd Shams, son of Abd Munaf. He dug these two up. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure, I've never been, so I can't tell you if that created a, a valley of any sort or this or that. But um, there was water there available. So it makes sense why people would come to this place it makes sense why there's water there. If there's a pond there, there must be some sort of stream or, or some sort of spring or something. And, just, and the fact that there are two raised wells creates a small little uh, valley as well. And it adds to that, you know, why people would come to that destination to bid their farewells and meet and greet people. The reason for stopping at Ghadir is because of the crossroads of uh, pathways going towards the south of Arabia, towards the east, towards the west. Um, and it's not just the fact that people from the caravan of Hajj are going to separate and go their uh, respective ways. But also, it is the fact that there's going to be people passing by uh, that particular area, that particular crossroads. And they're also going to notice that there's something going on. If you stop at a crossroads and there's something happening, there's a particular event going on, there's a demonstration, there's a group of people gathered. From all sides, people will see, they will stop to see what's, got, what's going on, what's happening. So this is also a part of the way of bringing Ghadir to all the people. That this, the reason I've stopped here is so that maximum number of people can witness, can see, can hear, and then later on go and ask questions, like what was going on there? What happened there? What did the Holy Prophet say there? So on and so forth. So, for this reason, the Holy Prophet chooses this place. It's a desert, it's an oasis, there's only a, uh, a pond, uh, it's very hot, it is the middle of the day uh, when the Holy Prophet of Islam stops at Ghadir. Uh, yet, 
He does all of this in order to make sure it becomes memorable. If you stop in the middle of the day in Arabia when it's the hottest part of the day and you're in an oasis, not much water around, no, no trees around, so on and so forth, it is going to be something that's going to be memorable. You'll not easily forget that what happened on that day when we had to stop and listen to the Holy Prophet Islam standing in the sweltering heat and there was nowhere to even take sh shelter or go under a shade or a tree. Um, so all of these things make the event of Ghadir and the announcement of Ghadir particularly memorable. In terms of uh, religious significance, um, the religious significance came at the time of Rasulullah when he uh, was actually speaking or was ordered by the angel Jibrail uh, to deliver this sermon. So this is why it has religious significance. Um, also, certain ayahs of the Quran were revealed there as well. And in today's day and age, there is a mosque constructed where a lot of people will actually go to uh, Masjid al ghadir to actually put on their um, a haram uh, before they go on any form of pilgrimage, whether it will be Umrah or Hajj. When the Holy Prophet completed his Hajj, on the last days of his completion of his Hajj rituals, and specifically on the day of Arafah, and on the mountain of Arafat, the angel Jibreel descended and brought the great message from Allah, the exalted, to appoint Ali alayhi salam as his vicegerent. And thus, this holy verse was revealed. Deliver what has been revealed to you from your Lord. And if you do not, then you have not delivered his message. And surely Allah will not guide the unbelieving people. This holy verse was revealed and ordered the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, and his pure family to appoint the Khalifa after him, the one who will succeed him in leadership of Muslims. Because as Allah appoints prophets, he also appoints the vicegerents, the Khalifa, the Wazir, as with Harun and Musa, peace be upon them both. So the Holy Prophet was ordered to appoint Ali alayhi salam on his way back to Medina from Mecca. So the reasoning behind the event of Ghadir and its importance and the, the reason why the Holy Prophet Islam ensured that this is something that needs to happen is of course that the first thing that Holy Prophet of Islam in line with all the previous prophets who made this announcement of who their successor was going to be each of the previous prophets before they passed away, they made an announcement and made it very clear this is going to be the person who's coming after me. Holy Prophet Islam is no exception to that particular rule from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we have to uh, appoint a successor, we have to make people know that this person is the one who's going to come after me. Holy Prophet Islam does this on a number of occasions throughout his life. Finally, at the day of Khadir, he makes this very apparent and clear. The consensus of the Muslim Mufassireen on the fact that this ayah, this verse, was revealed with regard to appointing Ali alayhi salam. In, in various Shia and non-Shia uh, tafsir, that this ayah revealed was with regard to appointing Ali alayhi salam for the Khilafah. Ya ayyuha rasul بَلِّغْ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكِ مَنْ رَبِّكِ O Messenger, deliver what has been revealed to you from your Lord. And it was exclusively revealed for appointing Ali alayhi salam as a Khalifa and leader, of course. وَإِنْ لَمْ تَفْعَلْ If you do not deliver this message, Allah's message, the leadership of Ali alayhi salam to the people fearing of let's say people the hypocrites others the munafiqeen فَمَا بَلَّقْتَ رِسَالَتَهُ 
It is as if you have not delivered the whole message of Islam. I don't want to say this was a threat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah is stating this fact that it is a, a real, it is a, a, a very important um, message from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Khilafah itself was very important and it required to be appointed by the Holy Prophet and deliver to the people that they must follow and confess to the fact that he is the Khalifa of the, the Prophet One important point to highlight is every single word in the Quran has its usage and has its particular application and purpose. The Quran says, Ya ayyuhar rasul, ballig ma unzil ilayka min rabbik. This is chapter 5, verse 67. O Messenger, inform and declare to people what Allah has commanded you to declare. And if you don't do so, then you have not fulfilled or have not declared the message or the in, uh, entire revelation. There is the description which is found in the Quran, which is min rabbik. Ballig ma unzil ilayka min rabbik. And if we reflect on the Quran, what does it say? It says, reveal, reveal to people or this, tell people what has been revealed to you from your Lord. In Arabic, normally, normally, that min rabbik is additional because ma unzila ilayk, what has been revealed to you, it's a foregone conclusion. It has to be from Allah. Because the Prophet wasn't being revealed to by anyone else. It's all from Allah. But why is it saying from your Lord? It's certainly a tool of affirmation and confirmation and emphasis to say this is not from the Prophet himself. This is not the Prophet choosing his cousin or his uh, son-in-law to make him as the vicegerent. Yes, This is from Allah. This is divine selection. It is not some choice that the Prophet of Islam had. And the evidence is found in the life of the Holy Prophet, importantly, because we are told uh, in some occasions some tribes came to the Holy Prophet and said, look, if you guarantee that one of our tribes would become your successor, we would support you. Some of them were huge, thousands in number. And that's all they wanted. They wanted after the Prophet to be given that particular honor to be the tribe that had the success of the Prophet. And the Prophet would say, it's not me who chooses. It's Allah who chooses. And it makes perfect sense because the religion of Islam, it's the perfect religion, it's the last religion, you know, and, and it is the religion, and it's there for the salvation of mankind. And therefore, it must be something that Allah Himself wants to protect and ensure reaches mankind and stays protected until the day of judgment. So the actual sermon of Ghadir, uh, you can split up into ten parts. Um, at the beginning, Rasulullah he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if he's trying to remind the people of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is and his authority over the whole of the universe and our obligation of obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the second part is he tells them why he's doing this sermon. He's, you know, he hasn't come to the point of why he has... Um, declared Imam Ali as the successor and as the guardian of the Ummah but he's telling them why he's going to do it so he's saying that I have been informed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I need to convey this message to you if I do not it is as if I have not even delivered anything to the Ummah as if to say that all my efforts have been wasted and that your religion is incomplete without this final um, you could say information or this final um, obligation or this final uh, understanding that after me there is someone else in charge who takes lead of the Ummah and who is there to um, take care, monitor, to uh, sustain and to maintain the perfect Islamic conduct amongst the whole of the Ummah. So if we look at the sermon of Ghadir itself, it's a very long sermon, uh, probably three, three and a half hours long, in which the Holy Prophet of Islam summarizes 
uh, all of his preaching, everything that he preaches in the sermon of uh, throughout his 23 years of preaching is summarized within the sermon. So he says, you know, I was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preach this message and then I came and I preached the message. This is what I did. This is the difficulties that I went through. These are the realities that happened. And now I've come to the stage and time where I'm going to leave this world. Um, at which point he, uh, there's somebody from the crowd who stands up and asks that Ya Rasulullah, if you're going to leave, if you're going to go, then who do we turn to after you? What do we do after you? And the Holy Prophet Islam takes two of his index fingers, uh, both of them, and he joins them together. And he says that after me, I'm leaving behind these two things. And he joined his fingers together like this. He says, I'm leaving behind two weighty things. Thaqalain. Kitab Allahi wa itrati ahl bayti. The book of Allah and my ahl bayt. Ma in tamasaktum lan tadillu ba'di abada. If you uh, stick with them, if you adhere to them, then you will never go astray after me. The narration itself explains. Holy Prophet Islam says, the reason why I've brought these two fingers together is because they're both the same size. So I want you to recognize that the Quran is as important as Ahlul Bayt. Ahlul Bayt are as important as Quran. These are the two things that I'm leaving behind for you all, that if you adhere to them, if you stick to them, if you follow them, then you will never be misguided after me. This is one. Then, throughout the sermon, the Holy Prophet of Islam reminds the people about the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about his own message and mission and preaching. And then he reminds them about the superiority of Imam Amirul Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib والسلام, over everybody else. He tells them about the verses of Holy Quran which are revealed about him. So he tells them that Surah 5 verse 55 for example is revealed about him. Surah 42 verse 23 was revealed about him. Surah 33 verse 33 was revealed about him. So on and so forth and he tells them about the verses of Quran about the hadith that he himself had said about Imam Amirul Mu'mineen throughout his life. And then he concludes and summarizes the sermon by announcing Imam Amirul Mu'mineen as the Mawla and the authority and the guide over the believers. This is important, of course, as we've mentioned previously, this is important because it's the responsibility of the Prophet to announce his successor. It, this succession in the past, prophethood itself was not left in the hands of the people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would decide and appoint and uh, make sure that this person was worthy for the task. And therefore the Holy Prophet Islam has also the responsibility to uh, announce, <coughs> he has a responsibility to announce the succession and make sure that that person is worthy and up to the task of succeeding the Holy Prophet of Islam himself. And then the third part is the actual um, commencement and declaration uh, specifically saying uh, that Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, is the next successor. Um, and the Rasulullah does it in a way, he doesn't just say, you know, Okay, let's say we can all go home now. It's not like that at all. Uh, what he does is that he says, uh, specifically, if you read the sermon, he says that this is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed Ali ibn Abi Talib to be your leader and it is an obligation to follow him whether you are a helper like the Ansar or whether you are uh, an immigrant like the Muhajir or whether you are an Arab or a non-Arab, whether you are old or young, male or female, uh, whatever tribe, whatever caste, whatever color, it is an obligation to follow Ali ibn Abi Talib as the, um, the successor of Rasulullah 
So of course, Musnad Ahmed said that the Prophet of Islam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam repeated this four times, Man kuntu mawla fahada aliyun mawla. Then he says, Allahumma wali man wala, oh Allah, support whomsoever supports Ali wa adi man ada, be uh, against anyone who uh, objects to and rejects Ali. One surman nasara, grant victory to whomsoever grants victory to Ali. Wakhdul man khadal and disgrace and humiliate anyone who uh, re, uh, does not associate himself with that particular important declaration. Now the Khilafah and the Imamah. Imamah is the, lead, the divine leadership from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a divine leadership and the Khilafah is istikhlaf, is when you actually appoint somebody after you. Maybe my son will be my Khalifa when I leave my home or my office or my work to be my Khalifa to be my vicegerent in my position when I leave. So the khilafa means is to leave somebody in your place when you're away from uh, your position. So the imam is the leadership, is a divine leadership. Yes, we have the imam of jama'ah, but the actual imam, the meaning of the imam, and in, in the Holy Quran, in Nija'iluka lil nasi imama, Allah says to Ibrahim, I appoint you, I assign you as an imam over the people. So the imam here is a divine uh, appointment, an assignment. So the imam is a vast, a supreme leadership over the people, over everything, not only people, over the whole universe. And khilafah is the vicegerency of the Holy Prophet The khilafah as the Quran states, that we made you Khalifa as well. So the Khilafa is to appoint somebody as well. So all these appointments required to be done divinely by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then after the declaration of Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, salam, the Prophet then goes on to talk about how the uh, declaration of the successor and the appointment of Ali ibn Abi Talib as the next leader is the completion of the Islamic religion that um, he is, you know, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam testifies that, Oh Allah, be witness that I have uh, given your message and uh, I testify that the ayah in regards to today I have perfected your religion and completed my favor upon man is related to Ali ibn Abi Talib and is related to his appointment as the successor and that without this uh, wilaya no form or any other form of Islam that does not include the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen is not accepted and that on the day of judgment that none of these people good deeds none of their good wishes or intentions will be accepted Unless it is with the wilaya of Amir al Mu'mineen. And this is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi saying this. It's not something that we heard and we derived from narrations or from um, texts that, okay, it says this line that today I've perfected your religion. Okay, that must mean wilaya is perfect. And if you don't have it, then you don't have a perfect religion. No, 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 no. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi is talking directly to the people, saying, that if you do not have the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen in your Islam, your Islam is not complete. If you do not have the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen, none of your a'mal will be accepted. Rasulullah saying this. One of the Quranic verses that has been disputed and uh, very much the subject of much discussion related to the day of Ghadir, the 18th of the Hajjah, in accordance with the uh, opinion of many scholars within the religion of Islam, is indeed uh, verse number three of Surah Al-Ma'idah, chapter number five. That is because the verse, uh, first of all, talks about the prohibition of certain products, meats, swine, etc., uh, that cannot be consumed. Then says, اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. Three things are categorically established to have happened in a period of time uh, on a particular day. First of all, there is the um, uh, completion of the favors of the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, perfection of the religion, as well as God the Almighty saying, I am now pleased for you to have this 
religion, you know, to have this complete religion for you. The question that, of course, we have to ask when we study the Holy Quran, it invites us to reflect, to ponder, not just to simply take what has been perhaps passed on to us. Perhaps we have just picked it up and we consider it to be the understanding of what that verse means. We must ask this question. This is so important this day that the Quran is saying, with this day, the religion is complete. The favors of Allah is perfected. Now, what is exactly that day? There are uh, three possibilities. If we study the Quranic uh, um, commentary books from all Muslims, Sunni and Shia, we come across only three likelihoods. Most of them have come to one of those three. The first is some have said, well, that's the day when Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made certain meats prohibited. But that doesn't make much sense. And the reason behind it is we cannot uh, except a day in which the um, certain prohibitions have been passed along to be the perfection of religion and the completion of God's favors. It is one of many other prohibitions or many other parts of Sharia law that have been stipulated in the Holy Quran. There is no way of actually coming to that conclusion. The other problem, of course, with this type of thinking is that there are other laws that have been passed on throughout the, uh, the life of the Holy Prophet. None of them, uh, perhaps some of them, even more significant than the prohibition of certain meats. Why does the Almighty say, well, with de this, the completion of the religion has occurred? So the intellect, together with the wealth of narrations, historical records that we have, would uh, reject this type of idea or this uh, insinuation that the religion has been perfected due to prohibition of certain meats. The second opinion by some commentators like this Fakhruddin Razi and others, very well known uh, commentator of the Quran, he says, well, this is in relation to the uh, delivering of the message. So. The Prophet is being told, you have to deliver the message of Islam. So, when the Prophet, uh, when we read the Quran, it says, Ya ayyuhar rasul, ballagh ma unzila ilayka min rabbik, O Messenger, inform people what God the Almighty has commanded you to deliver. And if you don't do so, it is as if you have not complete, you have not delivered the message. So, he says, well, when we put this together, we see that this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying to the Prophet, you have to deliver the message of Islam. Because if you don't, then you have not achieved anything. This, unfortunately, is flawed. Why? Because you can't say, uh, the Quran is saying, oh Prophet, deliver the message of Islam. Because if you haven't delivered the message of Islam, you haven't delivered Islam. It is very straightforward. There must be something from within the teachings of the religion that must be delivered. Hence, without it, the whole teachings of the religion will not have been fulfilled or not have been passed on or disseminated. It can't be the whole of the religion because it doesn't make sense. It would cancel each other out by saying, make sure you teach people Islam because if you haven't, you haven't taught people Islam. It's a very basic, straightforward argument. And therefore, the only strong, credible, established understanding of this verse that we have in the Quran based on the intellect, based on, uh, in addition, very importantly, the narrations that we have is the fact that it was uh, related to this glorious, very important, significant event in Islamic history, and that is to affirm and to declare that the vicegerent and the successor of the Holy Prophet is none other than the commander of the faithful, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, peace and blessings be upon him. After the appointment of Ali alayhi salam on the day of Ghadir, this verse was revealed. This day I have perfected your religion for you and complete my favor unto you and have chosen for you as religion al-Islam. Now, in the Tafsir al-Ghummi, a narration by Imam al-Baqir, 
he says that the last obligatory duty that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent was al-wilaya. Al-wilaya is the leadership. That's why we have the, the verse which says, إِنَّمَا وَلِيَكُمُ اللَّهِ الْأَوْلَى The priority in authority. So the wilaya and the wali is the one who has the priority in authority, in leadership. Sadly, some of the uh, non-Shia scholars described as a friend or cousin. Wali in this verse, in these verses, it means the leadership, it means the authority. So the Imam says, the last obligatory duty that Allah sent down was al-wilayah. Then he sent down this verse, the verse, this day I have per perfected for you your religion. And then the Imam says, salamu alayhi, once the Messenger of Allah established it in Juhfa area, just three miles from Mecca. So Ahl Bayt, salamu alayhi, they also confirmed that this verse was the last faridah, was the last compulsory act which Allah had descended upon his prophet to deliver to the people. And then afterwards, the religion was complete. The religion was completed, was perfected with the wilayah and the leadership of Ali alayhi salam. It is impossible to have somebody leaving his position as a leader or as a manager or as a company owner and leaves his, his office without appointing a deputy. Salam.